often I've had very similar conversations, obviously, with people who are liberal uh, on everything except except Palestinian rights. And um, it's often phrased as, well, you know, you have to see my side. You know, there's there's two sides to this. There's one side and there's another side. And it's it's framed as a religious conflict. Um, And that is fundamentally wrong based on everything we've talked about it's it's about colonialism it's about imperialism but i think there's also a a a, um you know a bigotry that that underlines that as well which is this notion and and you'll hear it a lot like israel represents the cosmopolitan west um it represents the uh ideals of liberalism of gay rights you'll hear even though i don't that Gay marriage, I don't think, is legal in Israel. Um, it, it, it represents fem- women's rights, and and it's um, and, and on the other side, there's the barbarism of the Palestinians, um, and you know that that is, I feel, that bigotry that does underlie that Zion, uh, uh, that Zionism, right? Um, racist tropes about uh, Arab people that are is inherent to that ideology. Yeah, I mean, there's an erasure of Palestinian history and humanity. And of course, there's an erasure of the fact that Palestine was and remains a multicultural, multi-religious place. And the reality is that, of course, Zionism emerged in Europe. I mean, I can't stress this point enough because it did not emerge among Jewish communities, ancient indigenous Jewish communities in the Middle East. And this is a point that every Zionist sort of apologist has to sort of avoid because it's so obvious in terms of it's not about being Jewish. It's about being Zionist and, and about imposing the Zionist project on people in the Middle East with, all, as you said, all these tropes, these tropes of, uh, you know, if you read Weizmann, if you go back and you read, and again, these are all available, you read Weizmann's letters, and he's one of the leaders of the Zionist movement in the early 20th century, read his letters to Balfour, they're kind of shocking what he says about Arabs, um, and what he says about sort of Eastern Jews, they're shockingly racist, in fact, you would say they're anti-Semitic, if you just switch the word Arab and Jew, it's, it's truly shocking. And read what read what uh, Israeli historians like Benny Morris what they say in interviews in 2004. Again, shocking racism. See what the Israelis today are saying. It's absolutely unconscionable. What so many Israelis? I mean, when I say most Israelis, there are of course exceptions. Um, and so, yeah, that's that's the history we're dealing with right now. We're dealing with this legacy of denial, um, and and this the, all these tropes that get used. They're all like, in other words, uh, pinkwashing and so on and so forth. These are all there to cover up a basic reality that the vast majority of the world today sees. And the South African case at the ICJ, I think, lays out in crystal clear language that this is an unconscionable state of affairs. No people should be subjected to what the Palestinians are being subjected to. And honestly, the history of the Middle East is crystal clear. There is a profound history of religious uh, coexistence and of secular coexistence as well with all the ups and downs and all the variations that that any good historian would tell you are you know part of that history um on the other hand what you have today is an ethno-religious nationalist state that's insisting on its right to sort of carry out uh genocide uh, they don't call it a genocide but of course that is exactly what's happening in the name of sustaining this kind of um state project yeah if you could just uh go even further in addressing how um, defenders often of Israel will say that there has been religious turmoil in the region for thousands and thousands of years. This I mean, is that's some absurd. Way a, a yeah. continuation of it. Yeah, if you could just, just ex- expand on that. I mean, it, it's absurd. I mean, the historical record is there. I mean, historians, yeah. you know, there, there's no such thing as a perfect history. And, and every history of coexistence is also a history of, of sectarianism. And every history of sectarianism is also a history of coexistence. In other words, Wherever you have pluralism, you're going to have, uh, inevitably, tensions. That's the same in America, it's the same in Europe, it's the same in in India, it's the same in any society where there is pluralism. And so too in the Ottoman Empire, and so too in the Islamic world, and so too in the Arab world. No surprise there. The, the, The point, of course, is that why is it that in Europe, despite the history of fanatical religious violence between Protestants and Catholics, the, the, the horrific sort of history of, of anti-Jewish, anti-Semitism in Europe. In America, the history of racism that goes on, as you know, and as you guys have talked about on your show many times, the history of racism that, that's with us until now, the history of the obliteration of indigenous populations. All these things that take place in the West, somehow we say, okay, these are terrible things that have happened 
yet we can still be multicultural. We can still believe in equality. We can believe in secular citizenship and so on and so forth. But when it comes to the Middle East, where there's a history, a much more profound history of religious coexistence between Muslims, Christians, and Jews, somehow we're told, oh, no, 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 in the Middle East, despite this history, no, these people are barbarians, they're sectarian, they're always fighting. It's absurd. It's completely untrue. And, you know, I challenge anyone to go back and look at the history. And, and, and that's why I wrote this book, Age of Coexistence, precisely to, to point out that the history, in fact, is, is infinitely more positive with all, again, without whitewashing the history, infinitely more positive. And, and the, the real issue is that colonial Zionism and European racism in the mandate period in the early 20th century came in and divided up this region, the Middle East, the Arab East, into various bits and pieces to suit European imperial interests and, of course, to suit the Zionists. And they destroyed Palestine. And, and look what's happened to Syria. Look what's happened to Lebanon. Look what's happened to Iraq. I mean, it's a catastrophe, honestly. Yeah, Professor, I wasn't able to find it, but I, I saw a bit of a pro-Israel propaganda responding to the genocide uh, charge, and it pointed to populations of Jews in Arab countries and how that went down following the uh, uh, foundation of Israel. And, you know, I think as we, so you guys sort of mentioned earlier, that's because of the rise of nationalism that that project engendered in the region. And it actually shows that Jews lived in those Arab countries prior to the state, as you say, in an age of coexistence. Yeah, I mean, again, that's, again, one of these Zionist arguments that that's, again, on the face of it absurd, because what happened, of course, to the Arab Jews or Jews who lived in the Arab world, however you want to describe uh, these people, is, of course, terrible. What happened after 1948 in terms of in Iraq and Yemen and other places was, was, was a horrific thing. But, of course, it doesn't, A, excuse the, the, the Nakba of 1948, and second, as you point out, it's tied to the Nakba. In other words, the only reason... These are, these are two sides of the same catastrophe. And so I refuse anyone who says it's either this or that. Both are aspects of the same terrible ethno-religious nationalist project that came in and destroyed the history of coexistence in our part of the world. And that doesn't excuse the people who reacted negatively, but um, that, that, that's what I would say in, in terms of a response to that, that particular piece of propaganda. But again, uh, what, I, what I do point out in the book, um, In Age of Coexistence, is that there were massacres of Christians in the 19th century, in Damascus in particular, in 1860. And there was no Jewish question in the Middle East. I mean, that's important, again, for, for your listeners and, and viewers to know. There was no Jewish question in the Middle East. There was in Europe, of course, because of anti-Semitism. But in the Middle East, the Jews were not the minority that were singled out in the 19th century. There were, the Armenians were eventually, and that's why there's an Armenian genocide that takes place. But there wasn't a Jewish question as such. And, and the interesting thing is that there were massacres of Christians, for example, in Damascus in 1860. But what you find is that Christian Arabs were the ones who, who, who were at the forefront of elaborating an ecumenical, which just means like a, a culture that transcends religious difference into, um, into a unifying uh, political, social sort of identity of being Arab in the 19th and early 20th century. All this happened. And, and so when the, when the Nakba occurs in 1948, and there was, for example, a, an attack on Jews in Iraq, even before the Nakba in 1941, in the, in the Farhud of 1941. So there was an attack on Jews in Baghdad, and it was a terrible event. But there's no reason why Iraqi Jews, uh, like Avi Shlaim's family that you mentioned, Emma, there's no reason why Iraqi Jews couldn't have been, and, and would have been, in fact, in, in a different universe, would have been at the forefront of elaborating a new kind of Iraq. But I think Zionism, honestly, Zionism, Zionism's whole premise is that you cannot be an Arab Jew. You simply cannot be. You're either Arab or Jewish. Remember, there was no such thing as an Arab-Jewish conflict before the arrival of Zionism in Palestine in the Arab East. There was no such thing. There's no reason why one could be a Christian Arab, a Muslim Arab, and not be a Jewish Arab. There's absolutely no reason for that, were it not for Zionism. Right. I mean, you see, uh, uh, there's even denial. I saw from, uh, I think it was like the mayor of Jerusalem, that there even are Christians in Gaza. <laughs> because, yeah, I, mean, I mean, that, 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 that it's, goes it's so deep. Arab equals Muslim equals yeah, barbarian. Um, last question before we, we let you go, uh, Usama. I just wanted to bring it back to the ICJ, uh, the, 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 the genocide uh, hearings opening today. Um, 
as a historian, could you talk more about the significance of South Africa leading the charge in this case um, and what your assessment is of this moment in history? Well, I think it's profound. It's incredibly moving. Uh, it, it testifies to the spirit of post-apartheid South Africa. It points to the fact that the vast majority of the world, Emma, the vast majority of the world sides with uh, the, the, the Palestinians and with the South African case. It's, it's evident. And if you follow the, the hearings and you've had a clip of it, and you know I've been watching this, it's, it's extraordinary, the detail. We've never had a genocide committed in our time live stream before our eyes where the victims are also live streaming their own sort of brutalization and victimization by the Israeli state. And the Israeli officials have been absolutely explicit in their intentions. So I think that it's, it's profound. And if you look at the, the South Africans who are presenting, notice who they are. They represent the gamut of South Africa, the new South Africa, black and white together, working together to present a case um, that is, is, is extraordinary. Any person of conscience should be able to say, this is wrong, this is unacceptable, this genocide should stop. And I hope, I don't know what's going to happen, of course, because as you said, it's politics in the end, um, in terms of the amount of pressure the US, Israel, the UK, and other European states are going to put on, on these judges is going to be enormous. But the reality is, and you see it everywhere, there is a generational shift, a paradigm shift taking place everywhere. Young people no longer buy the propaganda that's been that they, that that our generation, my generation in particular, has been subjected to, and my parents' generation were subjected mm -hmm. to. So things are changing, and the only question is, how fast? How fast will things change, and how many more innocent people are going to be slaughtered before the case of South Africa, uh, you know, gets a fair hearing? So I, I hope I hope that 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 uh, the ICJ will rule um, affirmatively just to stop this genocide. But we know that even if they do rule affirmatively, it's not going to stop necessarily because we're talking about geopolitics. Absolutely. At least I'm praying it can be some sort of pressure uh, mechanism. But um, Usama uh, Maktisi, the host of the Maktisi Street podcast, professor of history uh, at University of California, Berkeley. And the book is called Age of Coexistence, Coexistence the Ecumenial Frame and Making of the Modern Arab World. Uh, we'll put a link to that in the description uh, wherever you're listening to this. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Usama. Really appreciate your time today. Thanks for having me.